Okay, so welcome everybody to our first in our four part series, our radical new series on why capitalism is broken and how we can overthrow it. Um, my name is Jane and I am the Young Greens Political Education Officer. Um, so we've launched this series because our society is in crisis. The pandemic has revealed deep flaws in our neoliberal capitalist, capitalist system, where together with the climate crisis, the health crisis, economic crisis, employment crisis, each of these are demanding that we take a radical step away from the existing political and economic order. But what exactly does neoliberalism mean? Uh, where does power lie or why does power lie in the hands of the few? And how is it possible to actually imagine an alternative when our society has been dominated by neoliberal capitalism since many of us were born? So in order to change the world around us, we first need to understand it and know actually how we got here. And only then can we actually find the roots to achieving radical change. So what can we learn from historical and present progressive movements? What does a radically transformed democratic and just society actually look like? And how do we fight and win this alternative? These are all the things that we're going to be covering in this lecture series. Um, and I'd like to thank our funders for helping us make this happen as well. So that's the Federation of Young European Greens and supported by the European Youth Foundation and the Council of Europe. But, this lecture series is actually only just the start of a whole political education program that we're actually planning this year. Um, and I'm now gonna pass over just briefly to Rosie, our Young Greens co-chair, who will tell you a little bit more about what that's going to look like. Over to Rosie. Thanks so much, Jane, and thank you and welcome everybody. Blimey, I've been continuously clicking admit all. We're reaching nearly 200 people. So thank you for joining us on your Wednesday evening again here in lockdown. And welcome if you're a member, if you've been to our online events before, or welcome if you're new to the party or you're not a member. Welcome allies, friends. It's just so great to have you all here. Um, as Jane said, this is actually only the start of our huge, hopefully huge political program um, of education, political education that we'll be launching as we enter into 2021. Um, and following this, we've got really exciting plans to build um, build this, starting with firstly weekly online talks and Q and A's with grassroots activists, campaigners, policy experts. Um, as we hope to, after this kind of foundational lecture series, deep dive deep into real issues um, and very specifically depending on your interests um, and start to think about how we start to build that alternative whether it's about fighting for a green new deal or ending the marketization of our education system or how we challenge the hostile environment it's all to come um, so firstly we have our online talks and um, um, coming soon and q and a's and the second thing we also have um, and are about to launch is a brand new series of online trainings on everything from media and press skills to movement building and campaigns and we would love for you to come and join us at those so please do keep a look out um, but also we would be over the moon if you could help grow this work um, we know it's important if we're going to be able to deliver the kind of transformative change in society that we need to see um, and we need to see hundreds of people joining these events um, so if you if you would like to help make that happen, you can do this um, very simply by helping and donating a very small amount each month um, to this project. The same price as a cup of coffee, three pounds a month, would help us reach thousands of more people um, with our promotion. It would help cover Zoom subscriptions so we can handle the 500 people that are registering for these events at the moment. And it would help um, us bring in incredible experts as well like Sam Coates here today um, to deliver these upcoming trainings so if you would be able to support us and help make this go so much further as we go forward we would be so appreciative and I'll put a link in the chat for you to follow um, but yeah that's what to look forward to and welcome thank you all for joining over to you Jane. Great awesome thank you so much Rosie. Cool, so today I'd like to introduce Sam Coates who's going to be guiding us through this series uh, Sam has spent many years working at the forefront of campaigns pushing for radical and progressive transformation of society. Uh, he's worked as campaigns and digital officer at Unlock Democracy and as activism and events manager at People and Planet. Uh, he's also managed uh, major election campaigns, designed and implemented activism strategies and helped found a new political startup. 
Uh, and of course, uh, he was also a Green Party County Councillor in Oxfordshire between 2013 and 17. And most importantly, he was a former Young Greens alumni. Uh, he was a former chair, co-chair of the Young Greens from 2011 to 2013. Um, so today, Sam's going to be walking us through the concepts of neoliberalism, privatisation and austerity. Um, after that, we are going to have a 20 minute Q&A. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask Sam in that Q&A, what are you going to do? What we'd like to ask you to do is to send them to me. So Jane, and you can see questions here in my little title. So you should be able to go into the chat, pick Pick me to send um, uh, your question to. I'll be collating all of those uh, and then giving those to Sam at the end. Um, oh, uh, screen share going like that. Um, okay, and then if you have any technical questions, so about Zoom or if you require the presentation that Sam's going to be using in an accessible format, um, if you can drop Rosie. Uh, who's got technical questions here written next to her name. If you can just drop her a message, a uh, private message, that would be great. Um, okay, so that's enough for me. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sam now. All right, Jane, thank you so much for that introduction. And thanks everyone for being here tonight. It's so exciting that um, an organisation like the Young Greens is putting so much time and resources and really recognising the importance of political education for us to understand the world that we're operating in and to really, you know, we, that's what we have to do. If we're going to uh, be able to change it, have all the tools at our disposal um, for that. So really appreciative to the Young Greens for um, all the work that's already been done on that and the stuff that's coming up um, in the year to come as well. So let me just get used to operating two screens. Okay, so this is the basic overview of the series. So we're on session one tonight, which is neoliberalism, privatization and austerity. And what we're going to do here is really get some of the foundational understanding of things like what even is capitalism, what's neoliberalism, how does that fit into that, and what are the features of it, how has it influenced the um, society that we live in today, and what rules does it seem to function by. So that'll give us a really good um, foundation then to be talking about the historic development of democracy in the UK, how people across history have tried to change our society, through the, that means of democracy and through other means, and then putting that all together in the final week to envision a radically just and transformed society using all those um, tools and ways of an analysing the world that we've picked up from that point. So before we get going, we've got a couple of polls that we wanted to um, ask uh, you folks to get an understanding from each other of where people are starting at in terms of what we understand about these terms like neoliberalism, capitalism, and so on. So I think Rosie should hopefully be able to launch that poll and you can have your say. Great, so we've got two questions here. So which do you feel you know the most about? So is it privatization? Is it austerity? Is it neoliberalism? And what was the purpose of austerity? And this is what you think it was actually for, not what the rhetoric was for. So to prevent private investment being crowded out, to weaken the power of workers, and to reduce the national debt. So whilst we're waiting for those folks to come in, it'd be great if we could enable the chat for participants for a, a, a little while to just ask you as well, what comes to mind when you think of the word neoliberalism? What, what pictures does it conjure up in your mind? So hopefully we can enable that for a wee moment. Holding up the states, Thatcher, yes. Seeing a pattern here somehow. Pinochet, good. Poverty and equality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some excellent answers in here, and they're all right, really. What I've seen so far. Cool, so maybe let's close the poll now so we can share the results of that with everyone. So that's that's really interesting, actually, that you all think you know the most about privatisation, um, perhaps because you've had the most experience of it, um, where austerity is maybe a more recent um, thing that's happened since 2010, and neoliberalism 
um, comes out a bit ahead of austerity, which I, I, I didn't necessarily expect. That's great. And then people think that the purpose of austerity was to reduce the national debt. Um, and I think my fault that's been combined with another answer to shrink the size of the state, which I'm not going to guess which one uh, of those two people thought it was. So maybe we can stop sharing that poll now. And um, okay. And then we've got had, we've also had some great answers on the chat about that question. So that's great. So I'm going to start off by just saying what we're trying to learn here this evening and what the structure of the session is going to be. So we can't understand terms like neoliberalism unless we understand that the system that it exists inside of, which is capitalism. So we're going to define capitalism, talk a little bit about its developments and how neoliberalism came out as a distinct form of capitalism within that. Then we'll be talking about um, containing capitalism. So talking about the way that um, capitalism developed in the 20th century, how you, the power of unions increased and how that forced a change in the type of capitalism that we had, and then the backlash from the ideologue, the neoliberal ideologues that wanted to bring things back to the way they were previously. Then we'll talk about how neoliberalism drives injustice. So it drives an awful lot of injustice across the world, social, environmental, um, economic, uh, you name it. And it's traveled around the world in really interesting ways. Then we'll talk about in a bit of detail, the austerity program in the UK that happened from 2010 onwards. We will cover Thatcher's reforms a bit, a bit earlier on and the impacts uh, that's had on our society. And then at the end, we'll talk about quite a, increasingly popular idea but still not as popular as it should be which is that of capitalist realism which is this idea that after the fall of the soviet union people's imaginations of alternative systems actually shrunk and people found it more and more difficult to imagine what a different society would be like and why it's so important that we um do everything we can to rail against those so we're going to go through some key concepts first so capitalism, it's brief definition, and we're going to go into a lot more detail about it in a moment, but it's an economic system where the profit motive is the animating factor with a tendency towards ever expanding accumulation and ever expanding markets. And what we mean by accumulation in that sense is that the rate of profit will, will tend to grow over time. And that there's also a tendency for capital to be concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. So fewer businesses making more money and more profit being concentrated at the top, so inequality going up. And then neoliberalism, which we've all probably heard a fair bit about in our, in our lives. So it's the dominant form of capitalism that's been kind of across the world since the 1980s. And it proposes that the state's, the state's involvement in the economy is harmful to the natural operation of markets, who apparently know best, and wider society in general and its main features are privatizing public services or state-owned enterprises austerity so reducing the levels of public spending over time and oh, just got muted there by accident um so yeah the main features of um of neoliberalism are privatization austerities of cutting public services and deregulation, which is often forgotten about, but which is cutting workers' rights, cutting environmental standards, and really anything that gets in the way of maximizing profit. So on to capitalism. So it has some key components. So it's the overwhelmingly dominant economic system of humanity today. And it shapes the world economy within which almost all nations have to work. It's very difficult to work outside of it. So it's a system that involves private property, markets where goods and services are exchanged for money. And what makes it different from feudalism, the system that came before it in most of the world, is that instead of having lords and peasants, you have owners and workers. You have the proletariat and the bourgeoisie that owns the means of production, as Marx would put it. So instead of working the land that you live on or that you live near for subsistence agriculture to feed yourself, to feed your family, where everyone works on the farm, 
Workers lack any land, do not own any property, and have to sell their labour to those who do own property for the money that they need to buy food and to generally live. So instead of growing people's own food, they have to work to live. And, you know, that puts you at the, at the mercy of a lot of different situations. So whereas in the past, and most of the world's population were subsistence farmers until this point, um, it was about environmental factors. There were some ways in which humans in, um, affected whether your harvest was good and whether you could feed yourself. But now there was this whole extra human created economic system, which could also put up additional barriers. So, you know, wages might not, might not be high enough for you to um, feed your family, for you to get the basics for society. And that depends on a whole host of market situations. So in the system, capitalists will tend to pay workers as little as they can get away with. If there's lots of work that needs to be done and not enough spare labor or unemployed people to do it, wages would tend to go up. If there was not enough work to go around, wages would fall. And throughout history, there have not always been government interventions to stop wages being abjectly lower than what's needed for bare survival. So food trade prices would, would fluctuate based on um, harvests, wars and other factors, as well as economic things. So the condition and situation for workers under capitalism has varied massively across time and space. So in newly industrialising Wales, for example, about 20 miles north of where I live, in the late 18th century, early 19th century, mines were being opened, ironworks were being opened, and some of those workers in this newly industrial revolution were earning seven times what agricultural labourers were earning um, maybe 100 miles to the west, so astonishing differences over time and space. But then, of course, in the 1930s, we had unprecedented levels of unemployment across the Western world, and people marching on empty stomachs to demand uh, welfare payments and demand change to that system. So it changed a lot. So the system of buying and selling goods on a private market and selling your labour existed before capitalism emerged. There's been markets for a very, very long time. People, some people worked in textile mills, some people were paid farmhands, and some people did ore mining of various kinds. But this was not how most people lived. And some, you know, some people got very rich by buying rare goods in China and selling them in Europe for massive profits. But markets were not the way that most people lived their lives or did not rely on them for meeting their basic survival. So capitalism forced people into towns and cities through poverty and enclosure. Around the same time that the Industrial Revolution was happening, there were enclosure acts in Britain in particular that were forcing people off of common land, off of wasteland, which many people used for their subsistence. So there were push and pull factors of people being pushed into these new towns and new cities to work in these massive new industrial factories and becoming wage laborers under this emerging capitalist system. Now, many socialists have referred to the capitalist model as wage slavery. So we're not talking about chattel slavery here, where someone literally owns another human and everything you produce, but you have to work to stay alive. You can't um, exist outside of that system anymore. So you're forced to work and live on terms set by the employers in many situations. So what made capitalism different to what came before was that profit became the overriding consideration. And the drive for profit drives the development of new technologies to produce new things or more things or cheaper things. But it also meant that capitalist modes of production were entering into areas of life where they were previously not. And the profit imperative means that the system as a whole is constantly looking for new markets, new things to produce and sell. It's never content with things staying still or steady, which is why we, there were drives towards colonization. It's why the, it requires an ever increasing amount of material resources to create growth and why it's ultimately incompatible with a sustainable society. And it's changed over time. The original heavy industry that fueled armies, materials for col colonial expansion, um, and then we had light industry and consumer goods to the service-based economy that dominates today in the global north. So think of it with one example, Tesco, really successful supermarket in the UK, was not content with just being the dominant supermarket. It expanded into the kind of convenience store trade, became dominant in that, and also was regularly trying to do um, expansions overseas to, to become a dominant supermarket in other countries, but it often failed to do that, interestingly. 
So hugely profitable businesses tend to invest in what will produce more profit in the future. So the patterns for capitalism, its internal rules and how it impacts on the working class were first comprehensively identified and interrogated by Marx and Engels in the 19th century. And yet many of you will have heard of, of those guys before. And that was an analysis of how society worked as well as a critique. And people have written and debated its nature ever since as history has unfolded and capitalism has adapted to various crises. So you can think of Marxist analysis of the world, it's, you can think it's helpful without necessarily calling yourself a Marxist or thinking that their answers to the problems that we have are the right ones. And you know, I, I used to always say that I'm an analytical Marxist, uh, but I didn't think revolution was the, the right goal. So just to repeat again, those core features, we have markets and private property, where subsistence and informal economies were replaced with buying and selling on the market for life's basics. We had a new class system that changed from lords and peasants, where you often had kind of a, a moral relationship, an indentured relationship of some kind to a market relationship with workers and owners, the proletariat, who um, had to sell their labor to live and the bourgeoisie who owned the means of production. So that's the bank, a bank or a factory or so on. He had industrialization, so a period of unrivaled economic growth, technological break, breakthrough, and then he had urbanization. As we said, land was enclosed and people were forced into the cities to look for work. So at this point, it's useful to introduce a couple of kind of key concepts that help us analyze capitalism. And these are from um, Marx and Engels in their big volume, Das Kapital. So the first one I wanted to put, bring you bring your attention to was surplus value. So that's the difference between the value created by a worker's labor and the ways they're actually play, paid by their employer. And these profits are mostly invested to expand production, create new markets and to produce more profits in the future. So you might have heard that thrown about a lot by um, people selling papers during campaign events, but it's not, not really that complicated. And then another important concept is class consciousness. So that's the process where workers and capitalists as well, and owners as well, understand their shared economic interests with others that are occupying the same position. So what we found as industrialization was happening, workers were being forced into factories was that they were spending all their day together in these massive places, realizing that they had common economic interests and they talked to each other, they thought, oh, maybe if we work together, we could improve our, our conditions. So capitalism has changed over time. And this is where we're going to eventually come into talking a little bit more about neoliberalism. So don't worry about what I'm going to say now. We're going to go through it in more detail. But if capitalism is an overarching system, it's had many forms, which again have varied across time and space. These categories are a matter of debate, like the, this is the way I find it useful to talk about, but um, I thought that would be to demonstrate the point. So industrial capitalism is kind of the classic period when the industrial revolution was happening, workers were being forced into cities, into factories, there were very few um, government protections for working conditions, wages and so on. Trade unions were at some points illegal, Sometimes uh, unions were sued for the entire cost of lost profits um, in a strike. And over very slowly, government started to bring in some controls on the levels of exploitation that were possible, but not uh, to a very large extent. And then you have the Wall Street uh, crash in World War II, where you have many crises over the 19th and 20th century, but Kind of the biggest crisis that had then happened was the Wall Street crash in 1929, where <clears throat> um, public spending was collapsing in reaction to the economic crash. And there's a very prolonged period of mass poverty and unemployment that was only really solved by World War II. And then you had what I call managed capitalism. And that's the form that emerged after World War II in Western Europe and North America. And it's aimed to tame the worst excesses of um, capitalism to prevent levels of inequality from getting too high, providing robust social insurance for welfare states to, for people to fall back on. 
There were high levels of regulation to prevent exploitation secured by high trade union membership. And this is really crucial. Financial markets in particular were heavily constrained and used to serve the real economy rather than everyone else serving the finance market. And crucially, the state had a role in planning economic development. Governments aimed for full employment and owned large sections of the economy and universal health care, something like the NHS existed in many of these countries that had this. So you certainly wouldn't start if it didn't work, although you'd be encouraged to work. And also taxes and high incomes and wealth were very high. And that meant the inequality was much lower than it is today. So what happened next after that period um, differed in different countries. And as far as I'm concerned, that is really a matter of what trade unions were up to at, at this period. So in the kind of 70s and onwards from there, there was a general crisis in the form of capitalism that existed at the time. And we'll talk about that a bit later on. But whether your country moved to neoliberalism or welfare capitalism tended to be a function of um, how strong were the trade unions. So in the, in the UK, in the US, you had neoliberalism uh, uh, implemented, partly because of very strong ideologies, but also um, because of relatively weak trade union membership. And welfare capitalism, which is kind of... Um, slightly different to managed capitalism. It's not as interventionist, but you have um, um, a very strong welfare system, basically. That tends to exist in Scandinavia and sort of Germany, sort of France. And the difference is there is there's still very strong trade unions. And then state capitalism is kind of best explained as how formerly communist countries that didn't really interact with the global economy have entered into global capital capitalism in order to survive. Um, but massive enterprises are often owned by the state and internally lots of the other rules of capitalism um, apply, even if the profits are going to the state. So at this point, let's talk about what neoliberalism is and what its core features are. So neoliberalism was the other trajectory that the global north took away from managed capitalism. The UK and the US are standout examples, and it's based on three core features. So the first one is privatization, so selling off state-owned companies and assets, often at very reduced value. So neoliberalism insists that state-owned industry is inefficient and therefore wasting public money because it doesn't aim to maximize profits. So if you privatize something, it is more efficient. So then we have austerity. Although lots of economic theory has been kind of put out to justify this, austerity is designed to strengthen the state and to give um, capital more power over workers. If benefits are cut, you'll be more desperate to work for low wages or in poor conditions. And it's very different to the post-war settlement where my grandfather tells me that you could walk out of a job on Friday and be in another job on Monday. So what you're willing to put up with is very different. And then deregulation. So removing barriers to private profits, such as workers' rights, health and safety, and environmental standards. So together, these um, policies were designed to roll back the gains that workers had made during the, the managed capitalism era and create conditions that make it difficult for workers to build up power again, to exercise collective power and to improve their conditions. And to succeeded in vastly boosting capitalist profits. Wages have been stagnant for almost 40 years, um, even though prof productivity, so the amount of profit generated per hour worked, has continued to rise. So productivity has continued to grow, profit has continued to grow, but wages have been stagnant and for many people have fallen. So let's do a quick recap on the story so far. So capitalism emerged to replace feudalism in step with the industrial um, revolution. It's changes and it adopts over time to continue profit expansion and sometimes to deal with threats that might destabilize the system. Neoliberalism is a distinct form of capitalism and that is the period that we are living in now, certainly in large parts of the world. And for me, the most important variable in how capitalism is developing it's the relative power of capital over labor. 
which is something we're going to talk about a bit more now. So let's go in a, in a little bit more detail now to talk about why, why it's called neoliberalism. So neoliberalism is basically a doctrine for returning to liberal, laissez-faire or classical economics. It's got nothing to do with being socially liberal. It's got nothing to do with liberation groups. It is about economics from the point of view of those that have money and have capital. So it's economic freedom, not the freedom for people to live their lives with various choices. It sees individuals rather than communities as the prime actors in society and unrestricted markets as the best way to deliver on the common good. It's a political project motivated by undoing the post-war consensus, something we'll come to in a moment, and rebalancing power away from labour back to capital. So let's talk about the historical development of neoliberalism. So the problem with this unregulated capitalism that we had um, certainly after the First World War and during the um, Wall Street crash was that it was prone to crises where you'd have big increases in poverty, big increases in unemployment, and as well as causing lots of human misery, they would tend to destabilize capitalism because uh, people would get angry, they'd be reading their Marx, they'd start doing hunger marches, they'd be organizing trade unions, and it would increase the kind of level of what you might call revolutionary ferment, the kind of how dangerous society feels and how revolutionary it feels. So these crises just kept emerging every kind of 10 to 20 years. Um, and in the Wall Street crash of 1929, it just really got out of hand. It was a protracted crisis where unemployment was very high, um, absolute poverty was very high. And classical or liberal economics said you just had to wait until the markets recovered by themselves and for unemployment to fall. But what was happening in that situation from kind of 1929 onwards was the governments were cutting spending in response to the recession. Problems were getting worse because people were not spending money. Other people were losing money because money was not being spent in their businesses by workers. Um, and this was a decisive factor that hit the taking power in Germany, the just constant economic crisis. And I remember when I was studying history being told by, there was a source saying that if you lost your job in the early 30s, there was one thing, there's two things you could do. You could either join the SS or you could join the communist militia, but there was nothing else for you, really. So this whole situation of economic crisis was based on the idea that governments could only spend as much money as they raised in revenue and taxes. It'll sound very familiar today. But in the 1930s, an economist called John Maynard Keynes developed a radical new theory. He said that during an economic crisis, falling demand had a multiplier effect. So when workers stop spending on the necessities of life, that creates more unemployment elsewhere. So if I lose my job and I have to cut back on my food, the person that runs the shop that I buy my food from will be getting less money in. They might have to lay off workers who will then also stop spending money. And the whole thing just balloons until the level of demand as a whole in the economy falls, creates more unemployment, taxes fall, and the whole situation just becomes a spiral. But what Keynes said was that instead that maximizing employ employment was more important than worrying about spending or about inflation and that governments could borrow or even just create money by their central banks to stimulate demand and to get people back into work. And they could do this directly by employing people and the spending would pay for itself by generating economic activity and taxes elsewhere as those people went about spend. And this was used a little bit in the UK, but it had its greatest success really in the US, where the New Deal um, saw the government directly employ millions of people in public works, infrastructure, environmental projects, and many more. But what really saw off this 30s crisis was the outbreak of the Second World War, where Keynes' ideas were put to full effect and were pushed even further where the entire economy was converted to service the war effort and it was more about what can you physically achieve rather than what you what you can financially financially achieve what was considered normal was just changed overnight companies were simply ordered to produce tanks and guns and the necessary money was either created or borrowed from citizens to keep everything going 
And when the war ended, the US took the opposite um, approach to what various countries had taken in the aftermath of the 1929 crash. It saw that imposing brutal reparations on Weimar Germany had contributed to the rise of fascism and said instead, well, we want a stable world to trade with and we want to sell our exports to the rest of the world because we're a growing power. So what they did was they had this plan called Mar the Marshall Plan, where they were giving out loads of money in loans, but also in grants to Europe to help them rebuild their economies so that there'd be consumer demand again and that people would buy American exports. And Western governments applied the same sort of economic policies to building the peace as they had to the war. They were planning their economies, state ownership of major industries was, was normal, and there were policies of full employment. So the um, previous economic policies of either targeting inflation or debt was replaced with the policy of full employment. And um, and under Keynes' economic theory, there was this idea that you could just turn all these little knobs on the, the economy to correct uh, distortions and you could maintain that policy. But obviously not everyone was ha happy with this situation. The owners of capital were not happy with the high taxes, the high wages, or the regulation that was reducing their level of profits. So while all, all this was going on and material conditions improved for most people, in 1948, a small group of economists and ideologues met in, um, they met for a conference in Switzerland and called themselves the Mont Perlin Society, which was named after the mountain that they, uh, that their conference center was based on. And what these people did is they set up a long-term network and project to fight back against what they saw as the inevitable slide towards socialism. They agreed that they would set up think tanks, they would fund university departments, and produce reports for politicians to repopularize the idea of free markets and a return to the model of capitalism that ruled before the war. And Hayek, Friedrich Hayek, the leading economist of this group, um, said that you needed a crisis to um, impose the kind of change that they, that they wanted. So they waited out very quietly. No one was listening to them for a very long time. But from the 70s onwards, there was a series of economic shocks that started to make people question the economic policies of Keynes and his fellow travelers that had been followed for a couple of decades by that point. The OPEC oil cartel um, hiked pr oil prices almost overnight, which contributed to massive price rises and massive levels of inflation. And many Western countries had this situation that was called stagflation, where you had high levels of um, inflation, low levels of economic growth and high stubborn levels of unemployment. This wasn't supposed to be possible under the economic theories of the time. But neoliberalism, now with a thriving intellectual network of think tanks and political networks, was saying they had a solution to this. So here's a really important quote from Milton Friedman, and it's something that we all need to uh, remember and bear in mind for when we're um, working hard to change the world, but it feels like there's nothing um, happening very quickly. Only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When the crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That's a really important part. That, I believe, is our basic function to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes the politically inevitable. And in 1973, they got a crisis to try out these new policies. A armed coup was staged by Augusto Pinochet in Chile against the democratically elected socialist government. Helped by the US, as a way to fight Soviet um, influence, they were really concerned about um, tam taming the spread of socialist ideas across the rest of the world. So Pinochet was a really big fan of um, these neoliberal policies that had been popularized, and many of that clique now helped out with implementing of these reforms. So health and education services and the water system was privatized. Social spending was cut really dramatically. Wealth and corporate taxes were cut very dramatically. 
trade union rights were restricted, and copper extraction, a major industry at the time for the country, was opened up to private companies. So the kind of means of production, the really profitable industry, could be owned by Western corporations. And here's um, some of the results that came as a result of that neoliberal experiment. Wages fell by 8% within the period of his time in office. Unemployment grew by 13%. And Chile is now one of the most unequal countries in the world. And the social support systems like pensions are almost non-existent. It's very normal for um, people that have retired having to do odd work, odd jobs in the informal economy, just in order to have the basics for survival. The um, state pension is half of the minimum wage in the country. But it did um, fulfill the policy proposals that the, the, the um, capitalist class and the neoliberal um, ideologues wanted. Inflation was cut, which is considered a very important thing uh, for them. And foreign exports grew and companies were able to be bought up by Western corporations so that they could profit from that. The West would have to wait a little bit longer for the neoliberal policies to arrive. But from, oh, sorry, just missed the paragraph there. So that there's, there's a lot of debate about why the economic shocks of the 70s happened and whether they could have been avoided by different types of Keynesianism or, or radical socialist policies. But it's more useful to think about them in terms of the compromise that had been negotiated between capital and labour in the post-war period, which was a result of showing what was possible during the war, that social provision could be good, that people could have good working conditions and good lives, and that trade unions had become very powerful. The existence of the Soviet Union provided a threat, an alternative, so capitalism had to offer something to ordinary people to prevent them from becoming revolutionaries, essentially. So that's what the um, post-war consensus was. But by the 70s, um, there were lots of economic problems that couldn't be explained by the economic policies at the time. So in Margaret Thatcher, the, the neoliberals had their big hero that was really determined to deliver these in the global north. So neoliberalism came home with the election of Margaret Thatcher. So here is a, a, like a, a, a few of her policies. So huge list of things of state companies that were privatized. Interest rates were hiked, which had a big impact on uh, mortgage holders, meant lots of people were evicted from their homes. There were major curbs in public spending for most, but the police got pay rises um, in order to um, help her in the battle against trade trade unions, and of course, military spending was racked up as well. The top tax rate was cut from 83% to 60%. So this allowed profits to soar and it allowed for inequality in society to skyrocket. Trade union rights were, were restricted so that, when, so that they were less able to fight back against these reforms and less able to work in solidarity with each other. So it became illegal to have a solidarity strike. And the reasons that you could go on strike were very legally restricted. So you couldn't strike over a political decision, for example. There was, of course, right to buy it for council tenants, um, a massive discount. Those houses were not replaced. So that forced many, many poor people into the private rented sector. And of course, financial markets were also deregulated. So what were the results of those? So shares were initially sold to members of the public in the newly privatized companies but they were at really discount prices and they were quickly gobbled up by financial institutions that um, were happy to buy them from people at those um, uh, underpriced, um, at, the, at that underpriced value. So people had been given them for cheap. They made a small profit when those companies bought them off them, but those larger companies made an even bigger profit from basically asset stripping the state. There was stubborn unemployment throughout the 80s, um, 3 million people unemployed, there was a shift in capital homes to private renting and sky, skyrocketing inequality. So poverty went up by 68% in that period. And the deindustrialization process accelerated where you couldn't be working class and have a good wage anymore, essentially. So neoliberalism, the story so far. 
So it's a philosophy and a set of economic ideas that are designed to reverse the gains made by the labour movements and the power that they had to bargain for those improvements. It's a, pro a proponents took advantage of the 1970s crisis that Keynesian economics could not explain. And neoliberal policies have dramatically increased inequality, both within and between nations, created poverty and boosted profits. So now we have a, a lengthy section on how neoliberalism has driven social and economic injustice across the world. So after mostly prospering post-war, newly developed nation, sorry, newly independent nations and the global south were devastated by what was called structural adjustment programs that kicked off in the 1980s. So this was taking what happened in Chile and turning it into a package that was made a condition of accepting loans from rich nations. So in return for government loans, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, um, substantially controlled by the United States, forced countries to open their markets up to Western corporations, to cut public spending and to re-deregulate their economies. So classic neoliberalism. So instead of meeting the needs of their populations, these policies encourage these countries to produce often very environmentally damaging exports for Western markets. So think of things like too much coffee being grown in the tropics and too much beef being um, cultivated in the Amazon because it um, gets you get foreign currency by selling it abroad rather than producing things that your own uh, people need. It creates poverty and it's very environmentally damaging too. In the UK, um, the liberalised financial markets have really um, ripped through the real economy and they've allowed bankers to asset strip the real economy. So private equity firms have this practice of buying businesses like high street chains. They restructure them to make them more valuable on the stock market before selling them on a short term profit. So they're increasing their value in the short term, but those changes they've made often hurt the long term viability of the business. And in a similar way, residential care homes for older people have been bought up by these firms. And I think um, my friend Sarah is here today who told me about this horrible example where these residential care homes have been bought up by these firms and are demanding obscene profit ratios um, in order to give beds to um, older people that need care. So both councils and their families are having to pay extortionate amounts of money just for basic dignity, basically. And when you combine that with austerity in councils, it's just a ticking time bomb. <clears throat> And it's now really interesting to look at what's been happening during the pandemic in the context of all this. So the decades of privatisation have provided cover for the current government's crony corona contracting. Um, nice three words to see there. So the prioritisation of neoliberal ideology has contributed to the UK's catastrophic pandemic response. So just think about things like dithering over the extension of furlough because they thought it would cost too much money until it was absolutely necessary, had already caused unemployment. Sick pay at poverty levels, that means that working class people can't afford to self-isolate, is contributing to the spread of the virus. And of course, there's England's outsourced track and trace system, which is continually being outsourced to private companies with no experience of this. Um, it's not working, it's cost incredible amounts of money, while Scotland and Wales have been using health boards and councils to do the same job very well, because of this ideology. So here's some shocking stats um, that I've dug up on this issue in particular. So this was um, before, the, um, this was last year actually, so the figure might be higher by now, but £523 million has been awarded in COVID contracts to donors to the Conservative Party. Um, many of these companies have no history of delivering um, the services they've been contracted for. £10 billion pounds has been spent on no tender contracts for things like PPE, for um, test and trace, for all the things that have been required to deal with the pandemic. They've been issued without tender. Um, and it's very interesting to think about had all these privatisations not taken place, had the, the ideology of neo neoliberalism not been so dominant within the UK, would the state be able to do uh, most of these things that have been given to private companies to do? often very badly. 
And a thousand pounds a day is the average cost of consultants to the UK government that are working on the pandemic response. So it's a rip off, it's not working and it's leading to needless deaths. So there's a few couple more examples there of how neoliberalism is driving social and economic injustice. So instead of direct state action, neoliberalism has encouraged indirect market based interventions to address the climate crisis. So um, for those of you that are my age or older, um, you'll be very familiar with people talking about um, carbon taxes, about EU emissions trading schemes, or very arcane systems that are designed to turn carbon into a commodity that can be bought and sold on markets in a very um, unsuccessful attempt to reduce CO2 emissions through that indirect response. Um, in fact, some of the most polluting companies made a profit based on this policy at a, at a EU level because of the lobbying um, they did to increase the level of permits. Um, so rather than just saying the state needs to take action on the climate crisis, it encourages these um, market-based solutions that just don't work. And of course, many of you will be familiar with the spiraling university fees, and this reflects the individualized view of education as an investment in future earnings, rather than being something you do to improve yourself and to improve society. And the examples go on and on. So basically it's prioritizing corporate profit, focusing on the individual over society and the private sector, and it's all replaced public in the public interest. So, now on to the austerity policies from 2008 onwards. So in 2008, a crisis in the financial sector engulfed the rest of the economy. Governments were forced to bail out the banks, but barely changed the lax regulations that caused the crisis in the first place. So people were able to bet on pension funds, bet on toxic mortgages. And this is many, this is how, the financial sector being decoupled from the real economy, that what they were doing bore no resemblance to what was happening in most people's lives, but it was able to impact them when it, things went wrong. So the banking sector had caused this massive crisis in the real economy, tax uh, levels were going down, people were becoming unemployed, um, and the, the, the state had less money to spend on public services. But in Britain, and to a lesser extent in um, other European countries, but particularly at the Eurozone level, the right transformed a crisis of capitalism into a crisis of the state. So back in 2008, there were all kinds of articles about, oh, is Marx back, is Keynes back? It can capitalism survive, but we just need to go back to our friend Milton uh, Friedrich Hayek to, sorry, Milton Friedman, to see that what gets adopted were the ideas that were lying around. But the left was too weak at that time to and lead to a major reframing of how we understood what was going on. So the Conservatives instead managed to say, well, Labour spent too much money, um, they caused the crash basically by spending too much, and the answer to that has to be austerity. And although they painted it as unavoidable, the economic justifications for austerity have been comprehensively discredited. Much of the arguments that were made by the Conservatives at the time were based on an academic paper, uh, which if you actually went into the details of it, it turns out that they were saying that if your public debt was more than 90% of your total GDP, so if the debt the government had borrowed over time amounted to more than 90% of the size of the whole economy in financial terms, that would cause a recession and you wouldn't be able to borrow money from bond markets anymore and it would all be really awful. That was based on a spreadsheet error so um, there's just no just justification for it. There's not a serious economist that still supports austerity. Uh, the IMF itself has said that the um, 2010s austerity um, uh, policies have caused more harm than good, but it still hasn't entirely disappeared from the, uh, from the political debate. So, Let's just go into briefly what the impact was of these policies on Britain. So George Osborne's cuts were much deeper than Thatcher, um, which left a bit less prioritisation, but much more general social immigration. Most working age benefits were frozen for 10 years. Eligibility was tightened and it was more difficult to stay on. So 10 years ago, I was on the dole 
I was paid £55 a week. And today, if you got the same benefits, you'd be paid £58 a week. So they've been eroded massively. There's been a public sector pay freeze for most of that period. Funding for councils has been cut by 60%. So libraries, youth centres and all these really essential services have been closed all over Britain. The youth club that I went to as a kid doesn't exist anymore. And you don't often don't get access to those services unless social services think you're at risk. And general state capacity has been severely reduced as a result of just shrinking the size of public employ employment, which means that we're less able to deal with crises like the one we have at the moment. But what to remember, talking top income tax rates, wealth taxes and corporate taxes were all slashed during this period, which increased the deficit, if you like, um, but meant the profitability for corporations went up massively. So what were the results of this decade of austerity? We've had at least 120,000 what are called excess deaths. That's in a paper by the British Medical Association, um, mainly caused by the lack of nurses, but we can imagine there are more deaths that have been caused by gaps in social services and um, all kinds of social protection as a result of these policies. Wages fell by 10% as a whole, and only Greece performed nearly as bad in other European countries for that level of sustained fall in wages. And Greece had much, much deeper austerity imposed by um, the European Central Bank and did not have the same control um, over their regional policies that the UK does because they're in the Euro. 600,000 more kids are in poverty. We have a mental health crisis, an explosion of food banks that barely existed in Britain 12 years ago. We've had increases in knife crime in cities, probably as a result of the decline in youth services and, and social services. We've got falling life expectancy for the poorest and homeless services have been set back 20 years. When I was a counsellor, I went to speak to the CEO of a, a housing support charity who said that over the past 20 years, they'd managed to not just feed and give people a bed to sleep in, but to give them the intense services they need to actually get back on their feet, to get secure housing and to live um, live a good life. And the cuts that have been put through in many parts of the UK means that you're now back to that basic shelter and food service. So um, countless lives ruined by that. So we should see the post-2008 crisis and the austerity policies of the Conservative government from 2010 onwards as the latest power grab by that capitalist class. So public sector workers were the last trade union stronghold. Um, Margaret Thatcher managed to severely weaken the power of the trade unions during her time in power. The big private sector unions and the, um, the minor unions, for example, were all weakened. And the last remaining stronghold really was the public sector, which still remains quite strong, um, but you have to escalate those attacks if you want to discipline labour and make sure that capital has all the power. Impoverished, fearful and atomized workers are, likely, are less likely to fight back in a situation like that. And of course, inequality has risen yet again since 2010, and there's never been austerity for the richest. So last section um, of tonight's talk before we open it up to um, questions and discussion. So this is a quote attributed to Mark Fisher, who wrote a book called Capitalist Realism. And it's a great book. If you can get a copy of it, I really recommend reading it. It's really accessible. It's only 70 pages. But what he says in one of these chapters is that it's now easier to imagine the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism. So why is that exactly? Um, so this concept of capitalist realism, let's think about what's happened since the Thatcher government, since New Labour came and um, had their time and power and so on. After the Berlin Wall fell, it became harder and harder to imagine an alternative um, where reality, even where capitalism doesn't dominate our lives. And without an ideological foe in the Soviet Union offering an alternative economic system, Capitalism no longer has an incentive to offer anything to the majority of people. And what's been gone hand in hand with this is not only um, that that system won't work, but that, you know, you can be as angry as you want about capitalism, but if you don't believe that change is actually possible, then you're not going to take action on it. You're not going to organise with your friends and family to improve your conditions. And 
you know, this really, this is the ideological and cultural project of neoliberalism. So it wasn't merely just a set of economic changes, it was really designed to bed into culture. So Thatcher said in her time in power that when challenged on the poverty that her policies were causing, that there simply is no alternative. And that has been a very successful ideological kind of um, war on people's imagination in the decades that have followed. So neoliberalism has been a really successful um, ideology in sucking hope out of um, uh, society, really. And not only can you see this in the way that public services have been changed, so in the education system, for example, not, no, not only having to pay individually to access the service, but the way that the health service is managed, the way that schools and colleges are managed is increasingly uh, reliant on tick boxes, paperwork and bureaucracy, uh, which is meant to be designed to improve the efficiency of the service and the customer service, um, the quality of customer service. And that's something that uh, Mark Fisher went into a lot of depth um, in that book, the way in which these ideas had infiltrated public services. But it also encouraged us to think in terms of an individual about everything. So instead of citizens interacting in a democracy, we became consumers operating within a market and the market was democratic and that the best way we could express our views was by the things that we bought. And this reminded me of when I was 17, when my mum bought me a Che Guevara t-shirt from Freemark. So it probably cost about five or six pounds. And this just shows how even kind of supposedly revolutionary symbols can be incorporated into capitalist ideology and made safe. Um, so that they become mere symbols of expressing your individual identity and they lose any political meaning that might actually be dangerous to the status quo. So a modern example of this is the way that Adidas has embraced Black Lives Matter. And that's an important thing to think about is that individual liberation is not a problem for neoliberalism as long as it doesn't affect the wider economic situation. So that's why Thatcher was very socially conservative, but um, today um, things like gay marriage are okay because it doesn't cost the capital class any money. So just to wrap up then, we should see Brexit and the victories for the Tories in 2019 kind of within this frame, really. The lack of hope that change is even possible. And if you think about how we've been told for 10 years that the only thing that we could do was to cut public services, we couldn't um, have a better society. And then Labour turns up in 2019 saying, you can have this, you can have free broadband, you can have free this, you can have free that. But without saying what the system was and what, and what was being fought, it was simply give us the keys to Westminster and we'll do all this cool stuff for you. People just didn't think that was possible because of um, these kind of ideological warfare over those years. So if you want to really have things click, I'd suggest you read that book. Um, then just to end really, so that idea of capitalist realism was briefly burst last year by the pandemic and the rapid changes in society. So all these problems that suddenly all these problems that we've been told for years couldn't be solved were suddenly solved all overnight. So people who couldn't work um, were furloughed on almost full pay. Homelessness was almost ended overnight. Uh, the money was just made available. And I think we have to look at how this terrified the Conservatives and why they were then so quickly trying to reverse these things to make sure furlough wasn't extended because they didn't want people to have the time and the freedom to go, oh, it doesn't have to be this way. We can imagine things being different. They wanted to get back to the status quo as soon as possible. So um, that's been a lot of stuff. Um, don't worry, the slides will be available. The video will be available. But I want to end on this quote really, um, which is very relevant to what we've just said, which is that to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. And that's our job really. So Raymond Williams was a very interesting um, cultural theorist that talked about how capitalism interacted with um, culture and how the two things uh, influenced each other. Um, but it's important to remember that capitalism's only existed for a blink in the eye uh, of human history. For most of the past 50,000 years, humans have lived in much more egalitarian societies despite the 
other things that weren't as good about the societies. We have the means to live differently, to look after everyone's needs and for everyone to flourish. The specific system we have today has only been with most of the world for about two centuries. No time at all. And there are corners everywhere in society where things do not operate by this capitalist logic, from indigenous societies to the co-op economy to so much of our everyday interaction, which does not operate by this logic. So um, today we've gone through capitalism, neoliberalism, austerity, privatisation and capitalist realism. Um, thank you very much for listening. I hope that's been helpful and you're really interested now to see what you guys thought and what questions you have. So I think I'm handing back over to Jane there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sam. I'll, um, I think I'm gonna take take over from Jane. But can I just see a, um, I don't know, a Zoom round of applause doesn't really work, but like, thank you so much, Sam, for that. You can use the like clap emoji, like what an, what an astounding um, <laughs> amount of information to cover in such a short period of time and so eloquently. So thank you so much. Um, um, it was a challenge that we um, gave to you. Could you just explain how we overthrow capitalism, please? You've got an hour and a half. No, it, was a, it was a fantastic foundation and start and the questions have been coming in thick and fast. Um, so this is the kind of fun bit where we get to throw things at you which you haven't prepared <laughs> and, and to hear your thoughts on some of these quick questions. We've got some which are clarifications on concepts and we've got some that are kind of relating the issues that you've been talking about um, and the concepts to what we're seeing today in the current crisis so um, but thank you so much and thank you all for throwing um, sending in your questions you can still send in your questions to Sam during this Q&A by writing them in the chat to Jane she's got brackets questions here and she'll be sending them through to me um, to ask as well hopefully we'll have time to ask as many as possible um, but we yeah plan to finish um, uh, in around 8 30 so We'll see how we get on. Um, but uh, the first questions I thought I would ask um, that have come through are kind of relating a lot of these concepts and the, like what we're seeing in the current crisis, what we've been talking about in the Young Greens is how the current crisis is really revealing the kind of dark depths of neoliberalism and the impacts on the current um, uh, on the in, on the current society and one of the questions we have is in the current crisis uh, we're seeing scandal after scandal from our government you turn after you turn on their response to the crisis will incompetence be the downfall of neoliberalism <laughs> there's a big open starter for yourself wow this is a really interesting um argument that happens amongst the left at the moment isn't it because you know Keir Starmer says this is about Boris Johnson's personal incompetence and you know, I think that's that's the natural way for people to see it mostly. But you know, the British state can still do stuff if you really want it to. And the fact that that type of incompetence can happen in the first place to me signals the kind of lack of concern about the, the public at large and you know the deeply um, kind of ideolo ideological depths of the class of power that have been in society for so long, really. So, you know, in Britain, we've got the extra thing where we have this old boy networks of Etonians and kind of ruling, you know, aristocratic hangovers that just exist in a totally different world to the rest of us, where you could privatise the NHS, um, you could privatise streetlights and it wouldn't matter to them because they just, they're so insulated from the impacts of these policies and are often making money from these palace policies. So, yeah, there is, I think there's been a bit of a change in the extent to which the gloves have come off recently um, because it's just so nakedly cronyism, crony, crony capitalism, like a word you used to use for like Putin's Russia. Um, and, you know, it's, it's uh, to me, I think we have a huge opportunity to yeah, use this as a really systemic weakening of the kind of status quo of kind of the ideology that people tend to have without thinking about it but to do that we have to be asking the question how why are they so incompetent why are they so you have to lack care for people in order to have that level um of incompetence fantastic thank you so much sam yeah it's a it's a challenge and an opportunity at the same time at the moment um and actually that like leads perfectly into um the next question that we have that is um sort of looking like specifically at for example, the, the kind of the real crisis, material crisis we're seeing in care homes and um, in so many areas. Um, someone is asking, like, uh, 
to what extent is this kind of caused by private companies having a legal obligation to create profit for shareholders? And like, how do we change the way in which private companies are established to change this? And would that do it? Like, how would that, um, how would changing pri the way in which private companies are established change this? That, that's something that does have like cultural, um, you know, I, I don't think that is the main source of the problem that we're seeing, but it does have it does interact with it so i remember when i was doing campaigns at university or even when i was on the council trying to change procurement or to get divestment from fossil fuels and the pension funds for example and often this thing would be brought up that oh but isn't there this legal obligation to uh, maximize profit and you know there are always ways around that if you want to i think the eu is actually making changes now to its kind of internal rules about um that you can consider things other than profit for that. But, you know, there are there are other types of providing a service, even if you, it's not within the public sector, like you have co-ops, you have community interest companies, and none of those things are obliged to maximise profit in that way. So what we have to do, I think, is to kind of delegitimise the idea that the private sector is the natural and correct way of providing services. And, um, you know, there's... I'm really inspired by some of the Green New Deal campaigns in the US that are, you know, looking back to the New Deal um, in the 30s, which said that, well, actually, the way in which the state was tooled up to do all that work and that, those economic projects was really critical for the wartime economy, that the state had scaled up to a point where it was capable of doing things, actually fighting the war. And we should think in exactly the same way for the coming um, climate, I mean, climate crisis actually doing what we need to do about the climate crisis. We need to substantially tool up the state if we're gonna have a, a chance of doing that. And you know, that's that's where the argument is about this really for me. Perfect, I feel like you have just answered my next question, but I have got what someone from someone saying, with donor economics and community ownership of production of assets, could capitalism be reformed to support a zero carbon, one planet and prosperity for all? So a question about, is it possible to reform to reach a yeah, reach climate justice and reach zero carbon economy under a reformed kind of capitalism, perhaps like uh, within Kate Raworth's um, uh, concept of donor economics? Mm. You know, we're not going to have a revolution in time for cutting emissions to the 2030 targets that we have, right? Um, so, you know, a, a, a book that I found really useful for this was called How to Be an Anti-Capitalist in the 21st Century um, by a guy called Eric Olin, right? He sadly died a couple of years ago. But he, he provides a really useful framework for this where he's, he says, you know, there's nothing to suggest we're about to have a revolution, but there's all these problems that we need to deal with now. So what are the other ways in which we can reduce the power that capitalism has in society? And, you know, the, as I said earlier, I think the best way to do that is to encourage trade unions, either through our kind of personal activism, the groups that we're involved in, or those of us that have any kind of institutional or governmental power to a local level to really encourage membership of trade unions to build the power of workers as opposed to um, capitalist corporations. Now, we're not, like I said, we're not going to have a revolution in time, but we need to get rid of the idea that any of the traditional ideas of how you use neoliberalism to organise society and meet policy objectives is how we're going to meet climate crisis. You can use the state to massively um, decarbonise the economy. You can do all that under what is technically a capitalist system, but you have to be using these um, co-ops and these things that are not motivated by profit kind of you've got to make them a large part of capitalism. So that yes, it's technically a capitalist economy still, but we're doing more and more that does not operate by that logic. Brilliant, thank you so much. Yes, it's it seems like a tall order for revolution soon, but hey, <laughs> share this event. We might <laughs> win the next time around. Um, we bring more people on on board. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that, Sam. It's a really it's a really tough like um, thing for us to kind of manage and handle. Um, and thank you for the book recommendation. I'm sure people are scribbling away. And we will have um, further reading um, notes that Sam's provide for, for provided for you as well afterwards that will be circulating. So lots more to read. Don't the learning does not stop here. Um, but one of the things you just mentioned, Sam, is um, about like how important it will be and um, in bringing. Um, 
like empowering workers to kind of challenge the capitalist structures um, and the importance of trade unions um, and worker mobilization. And one of the questions that we've had come through kind of looking forward is what can what could the current trend of increased automation of work and scientific advances of artificial intelligence mean for labor, the power of workers and the fight against capitalist exploitation of workers? This is a really big question, and quite a big problem. Um, you know, some of you will have at least heard about this concept of fully automated luxury communism and the book that was put out um, last year, I think it was by Aaron, Aaron Bastani, but it's received a lot of criticism. Um, it's almost, which almost puts across this view that um, things will almost kind of solve themselves over time, not quite in time for climate, but in the longer arc of history. But you know, automation by default really does threaten the bargaining power of workers. And, you know, some of you will be familiar with the idea that it's not just the left that is um, pushing the idea of universal basic income now, because in an automated economy, if you give the proles a bit of money, privatise all public services, and then they use that money to not really have enough to, to live and you can't get a job either, then, yeah, that really undermines um, your, like, potential power as as workers, you know, the reason um, working conditions were really good in the States at certain points is because there was a labour shortage, the economy was too big for the number of people that you had. And that's going to happen in reverse, you've got this surplus um, population, as capital would put it. So you combine that with the fact that, you know, we've been more atomized in the workplace, there's things like the gig economy, we don't work in large industrial workplaces where we can all see how we're all exploited in the same way anymore. And there are no there are no easy answers to that. Um, there are you know, really great people in the trade union movement thinking about it, but that's something we've all got to grapple with ourselves. And I do think that kind of community level interventions like tenants unions, there are other things we can do at a local level that are not necessarily about our job, but expose our kind of class position in the system that show that we're vulnerable, but if we work together, we can um, change things. So yeah, join a tenants union is, is one, uh, idea I've got for that but it's a really difficult issue. Nice one. No yeah for, like uh, a really big challenge um, on the horizon and I think that's like a really exciting kind of way to kind of understand um, uh, reflecting on our position as a working class or as workers and uh, especially when we all experience work and exploitation you know, very differently um, and that actually leads <laughs> look at me transition leads me to my next question um, is is on um, there's some questions here on class and um, like in particular I thought, like some of the themes that were coming through I think one question that kind of sums up a few coming through are we want, I wondered if you could like help explain the difference between um, cultural and political economic definitions of like the working class and like how they sometimes kind of um, get used to mean the same thing or confused and um, maybe you could just help us kind of differentiate those two. Oh this is yeah this is one of my favorite things because we are obsessed with class in Britain without actually understanding it um, and not having any use to progressive movements for, for the most part like um, the BBC actually did quite an interesting, like, new definition of this about seven years ago. But when we're talking about class in, like, a Marxist analytical sense, there are only really two classes uh, of any note in modern society. There's the proletariat, who are people who have to work in order to live. They have to sell their labour power. They don't have property. They have to do that in order to live. Proletariat, working class. Then you've got the ruling class or bourgeoisie who own the factory, they own Google, they pay you to do work for them, which generates profit for them. And, you know, there are many people that say that's the only thing you need to, that's the only thing you need to be worried about. But we instead have this thing where we're talking about, oh, I'm from a working class background, but I earn 100k now. And, um, oh, I'm upper middle class or I'm lower middle class and all this stuff and you know it's i do think like how much cultural capital you have as well as like your fi family's like economic background does matter like i have found as someone from a working class family with very little um you know cultural capital that didn't, didn't wasn't brought up with mozart or anything like that and was not brought up in a political household at all it's a kind of like identitarian labor voting 
I've found that lack of like, you know, I feel like I have to do more to catch up with other activists whose parents like were in a trade union or were like, you know, had really rich parents that meant that they had more time to teach them things like that. So that does matter a little bit, kind of cultural capital. But when we're talking about class in a campaigning sense, um, you know, it's the thing that can unite us all, really. So you people are oppressed by their gender, by their race, by their disability, by other things. But we can only, in my view, like solve all of those things by looking at that with the intersection of class and saying, oh, um, working class black women ex experience a particular type of oppression that involves all of those different things, for example. And we, to me, we have to centre that to kind of um, avoid the situation where it's a kind of like Joe Biden kind of liberation politics, where like a rich black woman can be um, like vice president, but the structural like situation for most of the people in that category has not changed because they're still part of this like um, people who are oppressed by their class, by their gender, and by their um, yeah race. So yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. That was so comprehensive and like perfect. <laughs> I think some people were looking for. Um, so thank you for covering that for us. Um, I know we're running out of time and I've got so many questions. So I'm going to be ruthless and just pick a, a few as we as we finish off. Um, so people can finish eating their dinner or go and get it whilst it's burning or whatever, <laughs> whatever else people have to do this evening. But it's nowhere near as inspiring, I'm sure. But um, my next question, um, you, um, like, thank, so, thank you so much for giving us such an overview of neoliberalism, not just in the way that we see it play out in the UK, but the context of the kind of global project that it has been and how it's kind of almost been an experiment exported to various countries and, and um uh, we have one person who has um, like reflected on that and has asked um, the question, is neoliberalism just a new name for economic imperialism that has occurred multiple times in the last 300 years? That's a, that's a really good one. Like, um, you know, I'm, not, I'm not great on like post-colonial um, theory, but it's interesting to think, isn't it, how the very earliest stages of capitalism was where countries like Spain and Britain were just going over the, the sea, like just enslaving people and stealing people's natural resources and making loads of money out of that in a kind of political colonial relationship. Whereas not very long after a lot of the world gained its kind of in, became independent states after the, 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 after the Second World War, you had these new set of economic policies um, driven by the US more than the UK or by former imperial powers really, that were almost like doing colonialism in a different way. So rather than like literally controlling the land and the people, you just set up an economic system that benefits already industrialized nations so much that, you know, nations that have racked up loads of debt through just the way the, the global economy works have no choice but to implement all these terrible policies that only benefit rich people in the West, don't benefit their publics at all. So. Um, you could call that neo-colonialism, um, colonialism by a different route. Um, you know, it's, I don't think it's, we need to be very exact about those definitions, but yeah, it's very interesting to think about how in many ways, maybe things haven't changed as much as we think they have. Thanks so much, Sam, um, for your reflections on that one. Um, I have quite a few questions that are also come in um, quite similarly. I think, um, <laughs> it's, it's quite funny um, around um, sort of like uh, after listening to um, I'm sure what you've been saying and us all going well sure of course it was it all makes sense and of course it's been a strategy um, and so a couple of questions have been coming in about um, sort of like how we break the break down the kind of um, uh, hegemonic um, uh, what did you call it Re uh, yeah like a kind of a, a realism um, yeah. And uh, the first two, so the two that have come in specifically are like, how have, how have capitalists convinced people who are ultimately disadvantaged by the system that the system helps them? And cap someone else has said, capitalism feels so wrong. How do we tell the truth to make people aware of how wrong and flawed it is? It almost feels like there's a kind of knack of knowledge, a lack of knowledge, sorry, um, and economics expertise. Mm. There's a quote right at the 
middle of my mind that I can't quite bring forward about this, which is, um, I think it was from Tony Ben that was like, capital convincing poverty to do things in its interest is like the story of the Tory dominance in the 20th century. And, you know, this is a really important thing to understand because some people could read Marx in a classical way and just go, well, revolution is inevitable. People are just going to um, realize they're exploited and stand up against that. And, but we're doing that in really different conditions. And, you know, um, I encourage people to check out Antonio Gramsci, who was the Italian communist leader who was in jail um, during the thirties, who was really trying to grapple with that question. Why had people turned to fascism or just um, supported capitalism when advanced capitalist countries had not had revolutions in the way they expected? And there's a lot of culture at play here. We will go into this at least a little bit in the subsequent sessions um, because it's, you know, it's re been really important for my understanding of how to kind of intervene in campaigns and how to build movements. But um, it is based partly on this just idea that change isn't possible, that this is the only thing that does exist, um, like we've already talked about. Um, but yeah, stay tuned, I think, for the, the next, next session we'll talk about. <laughs> So thank you so much. I realise we're coming to the end of um, our slot now, so um, I just wanted to, I think we'll end there with our questions. Can I go another final round of applause um, to Sam? Thank you so much um, for this. It's been like, I, I, I've learned so much and I have felt like I was a part of putting it together and yet I knew I'd get so much out of this and I'm sure lots of people have as well. Um, so thank you. Um, our next, we had loads of questions about um, uh, coming through as well about democracy and the role that democracy has to play um, in this. But I wondered whether I could halt that and throw it to you to tell us about what's coming up next week in the series. Absolutely. So democracy and the changing state of democracy in the UK is a really important question in all this because we are told that is how we can have influence um, in the world and the way our lives are influenced. But, you know, we've seen very recently that democracy doesn't get us the outcomes that we want, that it seems to be able to be manipulated by the people who benefit from the economy more than we do. And, you know, there's, there's lots of reasons for that, but it's also important to understand the history of the UK specifically as this kind of imperial state that's had democracy grafted on without any kind of revolution. So um, that's something I've uh, thought about a lot and something that will be, you know, absolutely the centre of what we're talking about next week. So um, thanks everyone for coming and really hope to see you for that one, which um, hopefully you'll learn a lot from as well. Thank you.